right, welcome and thank you to all for joining us. My name is Dean Lee and I am Professor of Physics at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University. Today's public talk is part of an initiative at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The primary goal of, of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Ken Dill entitled, A Biophysical Perspective on the Origin of Life. Professor Dill is the director of the Laufer Center for Physical and Quantitative Biology at Stony Brook University and the Lewis and Beatrice Laufer Professor of Physics and, and Chemistry. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Mechanical Engineering, a PhD in biology with Bruno Zim at the University of California, San Diego, and did postdoctoral research with Paul Flory at Stanford University, and was on the faculty of the University of California, San Francisco for 25 years. His research is at the intersection of statistical physics and the biophysics of proteins and cells. He has worked on the physics of protein folding, computational structural biology, proteostasis in the cell, and on foundational problems in non-equilibrium statistical physics. He is a past president of the Biophysical Society and co-author of two textbooks. He received the Hans Neurath Award from the Protein Society, the Max Delbruck Award from the American Physical Society, and the Sackler Prize in Biophysics. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. If you have any clarifying questions during this talk, please type them into the chat or question answer dialog box. Otherwise, at this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dill. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, is my audio working okay? Yep. Great, all right, terrific. What I'd like to tell you about is um, a biophysics perfect per perspective on the origin of life. This is a, an old classic uh, problem of long interest of physical chemists, physicists, uh, and biologists. Um, it's often been thought of as kind of the um, third rail of science. You kind of didn't want to go into this field because, first of all, there's no experiments. It's not too different than certain areas of high energy physics, for example. Um, and there's no real key idea. There's a, This is a big field. It dates back to well, the scientific uh, thinking about origins of life, mechanistic thinking, goes back to the 1920s, uh, Oparin and Haldane, and um, many, many hypotheses and speculations and that sort of thing. But I would say there's no one key idea at the moment that has dominated and become a consensus of the field. Um, so any of us who have some thoughts about this kind of thing need to meet this problem with a considerable amount of humility, I would say. And what I want to describe to you, though, is a kind of a, a different angle where one of the aspects of the scientific question of the origin of life has been sitting right in front of us. And I think we just need to look at it a little bit more than we have in the past. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, thanks. And the, the crucial distinction that I want to draw about the way we want to look at this problem versus uh, some of the, much of the past work has to do by just starting at the very most basic point, which is, first of all, if I'm going to define, if I'm going to look for the origin of life, I need to be able to define what that is. I need to be able to distinguish between what's dead and what's alive. And um, there's a lot of shipwrecks on these rocks. People have tried to define life for a long time. And there's all kinds of challenges and difficulties and many attempts at defining it. For example, um, something that eats and metabolizes and grows and duplicates a uh, candle flame and uh, oil droplets can satisfy a lot of those requirements. But there is something of a consensus that has developed around the definition that NASA has. And that's shown in the blue at the bottom. 
and that is that life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Now, this is both odd and useful. It's odd. I've underlined the bottom part there, capable of Darwinian evolution. It's an odd definition if you think about it. Why? Because if you define, you're defining a thing, not just by that thing, but how that thing changes. Darwinian evolution is how life changes and um, adapts. It's a dynamical process, and it's not it's not defining the thing itself. So it's an odd definition in a way, but you sort of can't get away from it. All the definitions that seem to work for biology all have something like this in them, uh, capable of Darwinian evolution. But the second point about the underlying part there is that this gives us some clues about how to think about the origins of life. And that is to say, um, if we're looking for the transition from physical chemistry three and a half billion years ago to biology at that time, this definition tells us that what we should be looking for is the dynamical propagation process itself. I need to be able to tell you something about how molecules came to propagate dynamically in Darwinian ways, adaptive ways, in autocatalytic ways, um, before I can tell you anything else about the, the forms of matter that it entailed. Next slide. So in short, to find the origin of life, what we have to do, I, we believe, is ask first how Darwinian evolution got started in the first place, the propagation mechanism, the adaptation dynamics. Next slide. So the distinction is the following. Uh, a lot of origins of life research in chemistry and physics and biophysics in the last generation or two are focused on what I would call the day one problem. The day one problem is what came first, the chicken or the egg problem. And that is to say, biology has a lot of complicated and interesting molecules. Sort of the two main ones are informational molecules like RNA and DNA and functional molecules like proteins. What came first? If, they, if one of the one or the other of them did come first, it's, it's a, a real boon for modelers. Um, because it makes the problem somewhat simpler than trying to figure out multiple things happening at the same time. That isn't to say it's necessarily more true. It is to say that it makes life simpler for a modeler. So there's been a lot of effort at what came first. And the prominent idea out there at the moment, I would say, in that arena is the RNA world idea. This came about because in the uh, 1980s, uh, Czech and Altman discovered RNA molecules that not only could carry information like they do today and like DNA does today, but RNA molecules that are also catalytic like proteins are. And this seems fantastic. If you can get a molecule that catalyzes itself, you both have function and information in the same molecule. So there's this idea called the RNA world hypothesis. It's a pretty dominant idea these days about how things might have gotten started. Uh, another class of research at the moment is biochemical networks of small molecules interacting before enzymes came along, before proteins came along, that is. Um, a third class has to do with the lipid world, that is encapsulation. What makes cells in the first place? Well, it's their encapsulation. Uh, or the idea of self-replication. This is mostly in the RNA world. These are all day one problems. There's a lot of work in Origins of Life that's focused around day one problems, a lot of chemistry and a lot of physics as well. But we argue the day one problem isn't really what we're looking to solve. It's the day n to n plus one problem. We're looking to figure out the propagation mechanism, Darwinian evolution. How is it so adaptive? What is How did materials become adaptive? And once you figure out their adaptivity dynamics, then you can plug in whatever material you want and it will find its way into the future. So what's the process of change, um, the propagation mechanism? Okay, next slide is just a basic description of what is Darwinian evolution. And I'm giving you here, this really essentially all of what's here dates back to Darwin 160 years ago. Um, now, lots and lots of things have gone on in the field of evolution and ecology since Darwin, and there's a lot of subtlety, and there's uh, the so-called new synthesis um, and uh, 
uh, and there's variations on Darwinian evolution in terms of what is what has to do with evolutionary trees versus what has to do with more complicated graphs and networks. And we also know a lot about molecules and so on. But at the level that I want to describe this, 30,000 feet is fine. And so this is the gist of Darwinian evolution at that level, the gist of what we think we need to understand. First of all, it's descent with modification. That's um, probably the three main words that captures Darwinian evolution better than anything else. Um, second is mutations make random changes. This is now, of course, in DNA sequences and protein sequences. Those random changes have um, effects on the traits of the organism. On the right, I'm showing you a so-called fitness landscape. Traits on the x-axis, this is a high-dimensional, multi-dimensional space. But the idea is you make some mutations, you move laterally, and then you, have, you affect the ability of the organism to survive and compete. And so then it, by moving laterally along the x-axis, it moves you up and down along the survival axis. And that means you have uh, what you keep then, what biology keeps is organisms that have increased fitness for their environment. Natural selection tends to pick winners over losers. So that's the basic gist of, the, of um, evolution. Uh, now, next slide shows why we accept evolution as true. Um, in the background of my talk, I'm going to be also um, th thinking about some uh, opponents of evolution. Opponents of evolution object to various aspects of Darwinian evolution, uh, particularly when I get into the probabilistic aspects of things. And so I'm going to try to explain also why we, why the science field tends to believe these things uh, in the face of those kinds of arguments. I'm not going to go in too much detail, but I am going to mention them. Um, how do we know evolution is true? Well, first of all, you, we observe descent. Okay, you come from your parents, your parents came from their parents, we can see that stuff. And it's descent with modification. You do, you come from your parents, but you're not the same thing as your parents. You're, you're different. And so it's descent with modification. We observe it on a day-to-day -day basis. We observe adaptation. Darwin did. He looked at the the beaks of birds called finches, and he noticed that those that their beaks change depending on where they get their food source. They get it from the ground or they get it from plants. Their beaks change. You can see adaptation. So evolutionary and ecology, evolutionary biologists and ecologists look at this sort of thing all the time. Look at wing shapes and look at beak shapes and look at fur and uh, um, and appendages, and they are able to interpret. Uh, how they are these adaptations are useful in their environment these days in a more much more microscopic and molecular way we also know genomes in great detail we see all the mutations we get all the evolutionary trees um, you know it's pretty amazing we can see genomes atom by atom the covid virus comes up with a new mutation one week we know the entire sequence of its genome it's all its 29 proteins we know the entire sequence atom by atom within a day. And so now it's the case that we're getting something like a thousand human genomes equivalents per year per Illumina machine. Illumina is the, it's the company that makes the sequencing machines. 13,000 machines worldwide. So we're talking about millions and millions of equivalent human genomes per year. And so, and then, and there's many, many organisms that we have genome sequences for. So we know in great detail now, we can make these family trees in great detail. Darwinian evolution explains life's interrelatedness. Um, so this is the, the tree at the top is showing you that sort of feature. It explains the universality of biochemistry. The bottom of the picture is showing you just a little piece of a diagram of the biochemistry of a, an E. coli bacterial cell, but it's about the same as in us, the same proteins, E. coli, bacteria, apes, uh, fish, we all use the same biochemistry. And so the universality of biochemistry is also here. And in, and finally, the, it's the basis for modern medicine. If we didn't accept evolution, uh, we would not be able to use cell assays or mice or dogs to discover drugs. All right, next slide. So what we are trying to do, yeah. Yeah, next slide. Ken, there's actually a question. Um, there's oh, a question yeah. about, uh, about the day one problem, if you start from the atomic level, you know how did they combine? Certainly, nothing at that time can be described as Darwinian evolution. So, what drove the evolution of the molecules? 
Yeah, exactly. No, that's a great point. That's exactly the reason that we think you have to solve the day n to n plus one problem before you solve the day one problem. Mm -hmm. So it's very much, in a way, it's a little bit like thinking about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, as you know, is a is a state to state process. It's not a pathway dependent process. So if you want to predict an end state, you predict the most stable state in thermodynamics. Now, if we have a something like evolution is very similar in the sense that it has tendencies also, and it has tendencies to optimize its adaptation ability. So suppose evolution actually started on day one as some RNA molecule that actually replicated itself. Suppose that was true. Um, then the thing is evolution could very easily decide, hey, I don't like RNA anymore. I'm, I like proteins better. And then it could evolve and evolve and evolve. So what we see today is not necessarily what we saw on day one. So even if I could tell you exactly what happened on day one, that isn't necessarily the route that evolution took. What we need to think about, uh, we think, is the the process itself. How do you how do you adapt, and then think to whatever extent we can about how do we figure out in advance what these fitness landscapes might look like, so that we can predict what ultimately uh, organisms might want to do. So that's why I don't want to focus too much on the day one problem because I just don't. I think it's not. Uh, going to move us further to figuring out what the true origin of life okay. was. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so, so to seek the origins of Darwinian evolution, what we wanted to do is deconstruct. And by that, what I mean is I want to think about this as a physical dynamical process. I want to be able to write the math and the physics of a process. And the reason I want to do that is because ultimately I want to figure out how do I ex abstract out the essence of Darwinian evolution at a level where I can now think about its possible molecular origins? I'm showing you here in a picture a thing we call the Darwinian evolution machine. We call it the DEM sometimes. And this is the process by which Darwinian evolution happens in cells today. I'm just capturing what's well known in the evolution field today. But I'm capturing it in a way that we want to be able to write the math and the physics so that we can figure out, okay, what, how the, might this have mapped to some molecular processes way back when, three and a half billion years ago? Panel A, the, on the left, A of T, T is time. A is A, B, C, and, and A again are just showing you parsing the, the process of Darwinian evolution. By the way, this machine, I'm calling it a machine, and that's, um, it's fair to call it that because it's a cyclic process that's driven by external resources. It's like being plugged in, except in this case, instead of being plugged in, it eats food. So it's a non-equilibrium driven process. It undergoes these regular cycles. It produces stuff, namely it, it's moms producing other moms. It's cells that produce other cells. So we call it a machine, and we can write the machine cycle here. The machine cycle... In panel A, it shows you a stack of little blue things. Those are cells, and the stack means I have a population of them, and that population is, um, is call, I'm calling it X. Uh, we call these moms. We call each cell a mom uh, because moms, reprodu moms produce moms, and um, this is the process we're trying to follow. So what happens is there is a population of moms X in panel A, some one mom, now this is shown in orange, this is just a single cell, one mom mutates, and we call the possible options of mutations a momsemble. So this is an ensemble of possible moms. It's all the mutations you could get in one sequence that could turn it into any other sequence. So one cell mutates, that's panel B. Panel C, this is how evolution works today. Panel C is you grow up that particular mutation, the orange, and it turns into the, a stack of red, a population of red cells, we call them Y. And in C, what happens is you grow them up and then you compete them. So the red cells compete against the blue cells. This is the basics of Darwinian evolution. Compete them against the blue cells, and then there's a winner and a loser. Competition turns out one of them, if these can be predator-prey relations where one of them eats the other one, or these can be just competition for food. One of them wins, and then the winner gets more resources. In the next cycle, the next cycle starts at AFT plus one. 
So Darwinian evolution, we're just capturing it here. What's well known, this is nothing new from our point of view other than just that how we're framing it mathematically. Mutational sampling, you grow populations and compete them. The winner gets more resources. You go on to the next cycle. And so it's a machine that's driven to adapt. It's driven to search and improve itself. That's what it is. And the Darwinian evolution machine that I'm referring to is not a single cell itself. It's the process. So the Darwinian evolution machine is biosphere wide, if you like. It's us competing against E. coli and competing against rabbits and foxes and everything. All of, uh, all of the possibilities of mutations in principle are available. Next slide is just showing the one math thing I did want to show. Um, and this really is nothing more than illustrating a, a couple of points. One is uh, the middle part of that diagram that I showed before is actually a part of a now well-known field called population genetics. It goes back to Wright, Haldane, and Fisher in the 20s, and a, a model called Volterra, Lotka, predator-prey relations. These are just simply nonlinear, uh, ordinary differential equations. Um, and so in the panel on the left, R is resources, and so it shows you that there's a drain of resources that are then flowing through all the different moms. A sub N is mom type N, and this is showing you how the populations of mom type N is going up or going down depending on resources. So this is nothing more than sort of standard competition between two organisms for given resources. And there's a competition and then there's winners and often winners take all and so on. So this population genetics idea is, uh, is old. And our uh, flavor of all of this is it turns out there's just a few things in the normal population genetics that are simple linearizations and approximations that it turns out will miss some of the important 30,000 foot features of Darwinian evolution if you don't include them. So you need a complicated U function in here. This U function is telling you uh, what is the conversion from amount of food I eat to duplications, uh, moms duplicating and producing additional moms. It has to be a saturating function. We know how to do that. This, this curve on this uh, function on the bottom is showing you how to do that. And the main point of this slide though is just to show you um, how to frame the mathematics a little bit. The bottom is a list of properties I'm not going to go into here, but it turns out it does capture the Darwinian, Darwinian evolutionary dynamics. Uh, one aspect is mutations can cause um, organisms to become better or worse at utilizing resources. That's really obvious. That goes back to Darwin. It's also true, however, that um, these, that organisms basically are able to adapt to unru unruly resource inputs. Now, if you think about statistical physics, usually what you think about is some flow stream that's coming into a system that's a steady state in input flow. Uh, and so often in thermodynamics, for example, I think about a temperature bath, think about the, on uh, the canonical ensemble. I think about a temperature bath and I think about a system. What we have in biology is just exactly the inverse of that. In, in thermodynamics, the system is fluctuating the bath is fixed. In biology, I have a system that wants to become independent of resource fluctuations, and I have a bath that's fluctuating like crazy and unruly and unpredictable. The environment is going crazy, and yet biology figured out how to adapt to whatever changes in the environment happen. That's all in this model, and the basic gist of the point of this thing without going into the details is just to say, this simple machine cycle with this kind of dynamics in it is sufficient to capture all the features that we, we know are critical to Darwinian evolution. The main point I now want to make, however, is how do we think about the origins of this machine? So on the next slide. Um, so what is the essence of it? And how do we think about what molecules might have uh, looked like way back when? The essence is it's moms making moms. It cells make cells make babies, and those babies grow up to become more moms, and then those moms make more moms, and so forth. Uh, but it also it's not just moms making moms. It's not just uh, Xerox copies of things. There's variance for one thing, and there's fitness ratcheting, and those two features are captured inside the machine cycle. And those are really crucial to why 
Darwinian evolution has been so incredibly persistent. This is a dynamical system that has not never died in three and a half billion years. And if you stop and think about almost any nonlinear, any other kind of earthbound molecular system that you can think of, they all die way faster than that. Something about the persistence of Darwinian evolution is very, very powerful. Um, and it has to do with the fact that you are searching and sampling and that you're fit fitness ratcheting. Those two things are crucial for the long-term persistence. What is it? It's a non-equilibrium driven machine. Um, it's um, makers making makers. And so in biology, those makers are cells or organisms. Now we can think though about, well, what kinds of makers could we have had in the molecular world? We're thinking we, what we need is something that's uh, an autocatalyst. An autocatalyst is nothing more than, let's say if a type of material A produces that type of material, a produces uh, additional A's and it's catalyzed by A's. So the more A's I have, the more A's I make, that's an autocatalyst. So it's makers that make something resembling themselves at some level, not identical in this case, uh, but they, it resembles themselves. It's your lineage. If you think about uh, biology, your, your own lineage is your makers making your makers. Um, it's a disordered order process too. It's Many, many different sequences get searched and sampled through mutations to end up with one uh, good function. Taking random incremental steps, and it's it's very opportunistic in, uh, in ratcheting um, to better fitness. Okay, next slide. So Ken, there's a question. Um, is this related or connected to the work of Jack Sostak, if at all? Yes, uh, so good question. Jack Sostak, is a very prominent uh, now RNA biologist, Nobel Prize winner for other work years ago, but these days he's an RNA biologist. He is thinking, he works very hard on the day one problem, I would say. So a lot of the arguments in favor of the RNA world as a starting point uh, are thanks to experiments that he does. What Jack does is he puts RNA molecules into very primitive cell-like things, vesicles, and he puts in enough biochemistry that those mo molecules can make copies of themselves. And then he asks, what can I get out of this? I have a self-replicating RNA molecule. It's encapsulated in something, and what can it produce? Can it produce more of itself and so forth? Um, it's beautiful work. A lot of the end result that he will tell you is was his purpose is not just looking at origins of life, but also was, hey, can I just make some really interesting, cool machines out of things that are that look biological, but are not really fully all the way to a living system. And so it's beautiful work, but it's it's the day one problem. It, here's, here's how I would put this as, as succinctly as I can, I guess, would be to say, take a show stack experiment, put a pick my RNA molecule that can self-replicate if I give it all the right stuff, but the thing is, when I turn the lights out in the lab on a Monday night and I walk back into the lab on a Tuesday morning, nothing crawls out of a beaker. I don't get anything innovative, nothing new. It's, it's not life. It's something that the PI designed and was able to produce. Um, another metaphor for this is think about a self-replicating mousetrap. This is kind of the philosophy of day one problems in general. Think of a self-replicating mousetrap. What is that? It, well, it's a mousetrap first, but secondly, it's got some arm that reaches out. Whenever it needs parts, it reaches into a bin and it pulls them and it puts them together. And now, poof, I have mousetrap number two. So mousetrap number one, not only is a mousetrap, but it reaches into a, bill, a bin and it, it builds more copies of itself. Now that's a copying machine, but that's not a Darwinian evolution machine. Because what happens when the bin runs out? When the bin runs out, the um, mousetrap does not have the capacity to innovate enough to go figure out how to get food. And that's the Darwinian evolution problem that we have to solve before we're going to figure out origins of life, in, in my view. Okay, okay uh, next slide. Uh, so how did the 
Darwinian evolution machine get started? And how did how do we think about this in terms of what physical chemistry could have produced something like this for us? Now, here are um, some of the objections to thinking about getting physical chemistry to originate biology. There's this creation evolution debate, for example. Uh, first of all, um, hugely improbable. It's a needle in a haystack problem. How would I ever get a Darwinian evolution machine going with just simple chemicals um, in, a, in a beaker or in the ocean or in a warm pond or anything? Um, needle in a haystack problem. Secondly, how do I ever get complexity from randomness? This is called the blind watchmaker problem. Blind watchmaker problem is, imagine you find a watch lying on the ground. Um, it must have been created by somebody whose intention was to make a watch because how could you make something so complicated out of simple random steps? Um, crossing fitness valleys, I'll give you an example of this one. Uh, why is you can't make an, the argument is you couldn't make an eye, which is a very well adapted biological thing. You couldn't make an eye because half an eye would be useless. And therefore in the process, you would be expending a lot of energy and producing a useless thing. And what drove it? This is, uh, there's kind of longstanding arguments about doesn't it violate the second law? And I'll argue that no, it doesn't, doesn't it violate it at all. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. So I'm going to argue that the first makers um, conceivably were proteins because they actually have the features that we want in thinking about this Darwinian evolution process. So I'm talking about finding a process evolution from another process, which is protein folding. And I'm going to argue that that maps well enough that it may well have been the origin of how we got Darwinian evolution. Once we got Darwinian evolution, a lot of stuff happens from there. You recruit RNA, you recruit cell membranes, um, you bring in biochemistry, you invent new enzymes, you start building cells. Um, just to introduce proteins, though, not knowing for sure exactly the, the audience that I have here, proteins are the 20,000 different types of molecules you have in your body. Each one of them is a miniature molecular level string of beads. The beads are 20 amino acids. So you can think of them as 20 different bead colors if you want, and you string those bead colors together and it's an informational molecule. So it's a long stringy thing like this picture on the right at the bottom. And I've kind of colored the different amino acids so you can see how it's, a, in what sense it's a string and in what sense it's got beads in it. Um, and so one thing already remarkable about proteins is that Imagine the macroscopic version of this world. Imagine just building, creating all of our macroscopic world out of one type of matter and one type of process. So imagine I made a spoon and a fork and I made a light bulb and I made an automobile and I made a motorboat. Everything I made out of one kind of piece of string where all I did was I strung stuff together in a different sequence. That's exactly how biology works. It's just an extraordinary kind of molecule. The sequence of beads, the sequence of amino acids in the protein, it's what programs a device to do whatever it's going to do. And all of these devices are made by a single process, and that's very powerful. Next slide. So this is showing you sort of the essence of protein folding and function. Um, on, the, on the left side, I'm showing you I'm stripping down the 20 letter code to a two letter code. So they're red and blue beads. The red are hydrophobic. They don't like water and the blue are polar. They do like water. So it turns out you string different sequences together. And depending on the sequence of the red and blue beads, um, what you find is they fold differently. They collapse differently in water. Each case is trying to hide the red beads from the water. So you want mostly blue beads on the surface, water-like amino acids on the surface of the protein when it collapses in water, and different sequences collapse into different shapes. And each of those different shapes performs a different molecular function. So we have, humans have something like 20,000 different protein types. Even E. coli has something like three or 4,000. Um, and essentially this two-letter code idea that, that the 20 letters reduced to roughly two letters um, has been found experimentally to be roughly true. First, good first approximation. Um, next slide. Now you have to click twice on this because there's two little movies that are, whoops. Oh, oh this is a, 
this is a PDF. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Just take a look at the picture on the right. Um, that's a molecular motor. It spins. The red thing spins relative to the yellowish greenish thing. It spins. It's a real molecular motor. It's this is a molecular motor that was invented, you know, three billion years ago. And it works just like a, a human designed big motor. It's a rotary motor. This, in fact, is one of the most important proteins in your body because this is the object that turns your food into the energy source that the body uses, namely ATP. And so it's it's an incredible device. It's a as proteins go, it's a very big, complicated, multi-domain protein. Um, but many of the proteins in your body are just like this. They are pumps, they are catalysts, um, they are enzymes, they are motors like this, there are linear motors too, not just rotary motors like this, all kinds of different things, and they're all from proteins. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, you can't see this movie, sorry. This is What this movie would show you is that the picture on the left is showing you an amino acid sequence of an actual protein, and the movie would show you uh, it folding up. It starts unfolded like this, and ultimately it folds up into a three-dimensional structure. And the picture on the right shows you an energy landscape representation of it. An energy landscape is just showing you the energy the molecule, it's actually the free energy that the molecule has in a particular conformation. And that little button on the right, the black button there, is uh, moves, yeah, that's it, thank you, moves around and and flows down this thing. It's very stochastic. It's very much like riding a bicycle in a windstorm and the protein is flopping around and doing crazy wild stuff sto very stochastically. And that little bead shows it too. It will go down this funnel in very different kinds of ways. And from one time to the next, it will go down it differently. But the bottom line is the reason that the protein is always able to fold up to the right answer even though there's many degrees of freedom and so much Brownian motion and sto so much stochasticity is because the energy landscape is funnel shaped. So if you take a, a billiard ball and roll it down a funnel, it's going to find the bottom sooner or later, even if it bangs around a little bit on the way. Um, all right, so next slide. So this is some of the same statistical physics problems for protein folding. Uh, let, me, let me just say that protein folding statistical mechanics, the protein folding problem was a problem um, that a community of us worked on starting about 40 odd years ago. And it was more or less solved uh, about five or 10 years ago. By the way, this is protein folding problem was not solved by this new AI algorithm called AlphaFold, which is very popular and well known now. That uh, does structure prediction, but the protein folding problem was the question of physics that asked all of the questions listed in the bottom part of this panel. Anyway, the STATMEC got solved and we understand it now in terms of these funnel-shaped energy landscapes. So the questions were things like, how does the protein, how does the protein for a given sequence, how does it find it's one unique structure, and the answer are these funnel landscapes. It finds needles in a haystack because the haystack is biased, basically. It sort of helps you find the answer. Um, secondly, you get order from disorder. You solve this blind watchmaker problem. Suppose I were to say, to, to, mat to this metaphor, suppose I were to say that the native structure is a very beautiful, complex thing, and you find that one answer when you fold a protein, that would be the blind watchmaker. It does it by stochastic means. And so order comes from disorder simply because of the shape of the energy landscape. There's comb combinatorially many roots. So a funnel, you can get down to the bottom, depending on where you start, it can go in many different ways. And it's opportunistic, meaning that once you're part way down, then you, can, you take opportunistic steps from there, and then you're further down and so forth. So this energy landscape uh, shows picture shows how it is that we solve a lot of these step mech problems. It's simply, this is not a surprise to most physicists. It's simply that it's not about independent events in thinking about how proteins fold. Although in the early days, a lot of calculations were done on that basis, arguing that it should take a protein, you know, ages of the universe to find its answer. It doesn't take that long. In fact, proteins fold very, very fast in order of microseconds for many of them. They fold very fast. And it's simply because small biases add up 
and they're local. And even if they're random, there's many, many routes. All right, so the next slide. Oh, by the way, can, uh, can uh, Pablo suggest that uh, one of my friends suggested putting the link to the uh, to, to the Harvard page. So I put that link in so people can see some of the animations that we weren't showing. Oh, great, 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 great. Excellent. Thank you. Good idea. So this is just showing you sort of the how to how to think about the statistics in ways I just mentioned, basically the blind watchmaker idea. So protein folding landscapes so are anywhere are of order tens to hundreds of thousands of d dimensions. And so think about a golf course in 100,000 dimensions. It's flat, but there's one golf course hole. Now, in that many dimensions, the thing is it would take ages of the universe to ever find the answer because your golf court ball is just gonna roll around randomly. That's really the blind watchmaker picture. That comes from just simply thinking about the problem in too simplified a way. Once you recognize that protein folding actually has these biases, what you see is you, the real answer is that proteins fold on these funnel-shaped landscapes. You have many, many different routes. You can start from anywhere you want to, these different black points or different starting points, different unfolded conformations of the molecule, and yet you can always find the native structure. So it's a way to find global minima through making local, random, slightly biased choices. Okay, next slide. Uh, evolution is very similar probability question. How do you take random steps to get good adaptation? Let's say you're, you ultimately find an organism has an eyeball or it has an ear or has a brain or something. Um, how did you get there from random steps? Well, again, the argument from statistical mechanics is that it's not the, it's not the smallness of probabilities that matter. It's the correlations of them and it's the numbers of roots. And so it's the shape of some kind of a landscape. So needles and haystacks aren't the real problem here typically. It's find, it's figuring out sort of what led to what next. Um, the, and we have order from disorder, a similar kind of thing in the sense that you have many, many different mutations and sequences. And yet sooner or later, the evolution process leads you, this Darwinian evolution machine leads you to a good adaptation. Um, so let me go through the next slide. Um, I'll take these next ones briefly because this is kind of just illustrative those points that are mostly obvious, I think, to most of the physicists here. There's a thing called the black swan, which is an expression that, uh, gee, something is a very rare event because you almost never see a black swan, but you sometimes do. There are black swans down in Australia or New Zealand or somewhere. This is a picture of a black swan. So next slide shows you, well, what are the odds of this? Well, the answer is no, it's not one over large number to the sixth power because they're correlated. If you see one black swan, there's mom and dad somewhere nearby, and there's the kids somewhere nearby, and there's a whole community somewhere nearby. And all you got to do is recognize um, that there's where it's coming from and the mechanism. And then you can see right off the bat that finding six black swans is not so incredibly improbable as it might seem. Next slide. And so there's a similar thing that comes up in the odds of originating a protein molecule. <clears throat> and this is, can come up often in the creation evolution debate. What is the chance of finding lysozyme? Lysozyme is a protein that's 130 amino acids long. And so if you go through, the bottom picture is showing you, I have these strings of bead colors, <clears throat> 20 different beads at each spot. And I have a hundred and the thing is 130 units long. So 20 to the 130th is how many options I have. And well, the lysozyme sequence, um, therefore finding that one specific sequence of a given life lysozyme, the probability of it is uh, one over 20 to the 130th. And sure enough, that's zero. However, um, the next slide shows why that turns out to be kind of the wrong answer because it's we're asking here not for the odds of finding an amino acid sequence because it's there's a huge degeneracy many different sequences will give will fold to the same protein structure what are the odds of finding a protein structure because it's structure function in proteins that matter to biology <clears throat> well it turns out everything on the left i'm showing you in this little panel showing you a whole lot of sequences 
and there's redness and there's blueness. And if I just reduce this down from a 20 letter code to the essence of what folding a structure is all about to a two letter code, it turns out the problem reduces by 130 orders of magnitude for trying to find any sequence that will fold to the lysozyme structure. That's what biology cares about. Biology cares about the structure because that's what determines the function. So we have hundreds of orders of magnitude difference in the answer by recognizing where the physics comes from. We also happen to know this is not just a theoretical argument. Experiments were done. So this argument we and other people were making in the late 1980s and in the 1990s, there were some very prominent papers in Science and Nature showing that if you strip out the sequence of a protein and you replace it with uh, two beads, hydrophobic and polar, that yes, indeed, you get something like this 130 orders of magnitude. So it's experimentally validated as well. All right, next slide. Okay, so here's the half an eye argument I mentioned before. The claim is evolution couldn't survive low fitness steps. But the reality is half means primitive, not incomplete. So the picture on the bottom is showing you sort of the complaint about evolution. Well, you know, you're going through a fitness minimum and there is something's going to beat it out because you spent a lot of energy getting there and it's worthless and so on. The next couple of slides, though, I think illustrate a little more clearly what the answer to this is. What good is half an iPhone? So I'm going to give you an argument now that about how did we get to an iPhone? Now, and the point is, what is half an iPhone? It is not an iPhone that I simply saw in half. Yes, that's truly worthless. No question about it. Money wasted. Half an iPhone is means where were you halfway along the process of the invention of an iPhone? So the next slide shows you that. Here's a timeline. Industrial, uh, industrial evolution, by the way, is very Darwinian. And so this is a pretty, gives a pretty good example of the sort of thing that we're looking for. Look at the right on the, first of all, 2012, here's the iPhone 5. This is pretty out of date now, unfortunately. Anyway, 2012, this is the endpoint, iPhone 5. What is half an iPhone 5? Well, go back to 1944, computers were being invented. We got solid state electronics. We got the transistor, wireless communications, and GPS. That all happened in the, in the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Sorry, this, for some reason, stuff got screwed up a little bit on this figure. But you can see the essence of this. Half an iPhone 5 is not sawing the iPhone 5 in half. It is the Altair computer. It's the IBM PC. It's the Apple II. It's the uh, first transistor. It's all kinds of things that were not aimed in any way at becoming an iPhone. There was never that, you know, back in the 1940s, nobody said, ah, oh, let's make an iPhone. It was not targeted. It was just a lot of opportunistic changes and ultimately led to an iPhone. And so this is the argument that um, there's many different routes on fitness landscapes, and they don't necessarily have to lead through something that's just a sawed in half. Um, iPhone. Next slide shows you how this comes out in the half an eye argument. <clears throat> this slide is a little complicated, sorry, but the gist of it is, look at the top row first, that it could evolve through very simple steps. Basically, you get some light sensitive cells that are all collected together in a membrane. That's helpful to the organism because it can sense light and dark. It curves around, step two is it curves around a little bit. That's helpful to the organism because it can focus light a little bit. Step three, you get a fluid filled cavity. Now you really get some lensing and that's even more helpful to the organism. And finally, you get all the way to the eye on the right hand side. And you can see this in evolutionary history. These are the things that you see all the way along. So this is really the story of what half an eye is all about. So fitness uh, evolution has many ways to, to get to to, to ultimately where we see it today. Next slide. Um, I more or less just said that, so let me now get into the, the last parts of this. Uh, next slide. Question is, uh, does biology violate the second law? Uh, no, the problem with the second law is the second law is about equilibrium. It's about how do you get towards equilibrium? Life is a non-equilibrium process. It's driven. It's driven by resource intake. And non-equilibria turn out to be pretty different often than equilibrium processes. So increase in entropy, not necessarily relevant in any way. 
Moreover, biology's entropy, when people argue, well, look, bi biology got uh, complex and thermodynamics says things are supposed to get more disordered. Those are two very different beasts. The disorder entropy in materials and biology's complexity, uh, it's very hard to put them on the same scale because the bottom line is what biology's complexity is really all about is fitness landscapes, not entropy, not thermal entropy, not P log P. Next slide shows, gives you an illustration of this. The left little orange thing, yellow thing, shows you in the sea of all of non-equilibrium and equilibrium, there's a certain class of things that are relaxing to equilibrium and that we know about or steady state systems and so forth. Middle shows you a driven system. So think about an electromagnet. Um, when I have, I have a rod and I have a coil around it, when I don't have any current going through the coil, nothing happens. When I run a current through the coil, I can pick up nails. So it's an electromagnet. It only works when it's turned on, when it's plugged in. Motors uh, to the next panel down need to be plugged in. Television sets need to be plugged in. Hurricanes get energy from warm oceans, things like that. These are all driven systems. They're not tending to equilibrium until you unplug the thing. And as long as they're driven, then the question is, what are they driven towards? And well, that's however this system is designed. A television set does a lot of complicated stuff. And as long as it's plugged in, it's going to continue doing that. And likewise, biology has a whole lot of examples. Um, uh, food, you feed more food into E. coli. And you ask how fast does it duplicate, ATP-driven machines, and so on. Uh, essentially, all of biology is driven and adaptive. And the bottom line is um, this doesn't violate the second law in any way because this is all about non-equilibrium processes. All right, next slide. Okay, finally, I just want to, in the last several slides, I want to postulate for you a possible mechanism that relates protein folding as a process to evolution as a process. So how did the Darwinian evolution machine first arise? We're looking for makers making makers. In our case, we're thinking molecules now. What is a disorder to order process that will lead to an auto catalysis? How did sequence to structure, uh, sequence to function arise? And what was fitness before cells? Okay, so the next slide is showing you the challenge. Uh, this is what's known about prebiotic syntheses is if you start with uh, monomers like amino acids, you polymerize them on some kind of a surface, uh, a catalyst surface, like a clay, clay minerals people sometimes think of as possible prebiotic catalysts, then it turns out what you will get is mostly short chains. Uh, we call this the Flory problem. Flory showed that polymerizations all have the same feature. That uh, picture on the right shows you the population in a, on a log scale on the y-axis and as a function of chain length on the x-axis, and the bottom line is most polymerizations will give you lots of short things and not very many long things. And this is the problem for origins of life. If I'm making amino acids and I can only make things that are five or six or eight uh, amino acids long, that's not long enough to make proteins. It's not long enough to be interesting biology. So how do we solve that? So the next slide shows that these HP polymers um, may be the solution to this problem. They, do, they will fold in water uh, because of their hydrophobic amino acids. Some sequences are non-folders. Lots of sequences are non-folders. The all P sequence is a non-folder, and the all H sequence is nothing but an aggregator. It's just, it's just uh, stuff that gums up. Uh, some of them will fold in ways I showed before. That's the middle panel. And some fold and are would be catalysts, as I show on the bottom. What I mean by a catalyst here is there's a landing pad on the bottom. You see um, four red beads all together. And where there's enough red beads all together, that's a hydrophobic surface. And this molecule itself, though, is dissolved in water. So this is a hydrophobic surface floating around in water, and it can catalyze weakly uh, other reactions. So next slide shows you this catalysis process. The, from left to right is a sequence. It folds up in water, becomes compact. It has the red beads as a core, but it has a hydrophobic landing pad here. A different chain shown in the top has a 
um, short chain and the hydrophobic monomer, they come together. And by virtue of the spatial localization, it helps accelerate the elongation of the top chain. So you can elongate chains. Next slide shows you the computer simulations we do. It validates that um, this mechanism works in the computer. So top right picture, the green line and the gray lines show you all the standard polymerization processes <clears throat> that we can model in the computer. But the orange one shows you that even though these catalysts are not very good, and even though there's a relatively small number of them, they do lead to pretty substantial chain elongations in principle. Um, they are also autocatalytic sets. So you start with random little peptides and you make these sequences and some of them have fold and some of them have, have these landing pads and they catalyze the elongation of other chains. So they, this is a disordered order process that leads to autocatalytic sets. It leads to elongation of chains. They become informational and it gives you a diversity of folds and therefore a diversity of primitive functions. All right, last slide I think is showing you a simulation we're in just in the middle of right now, which is that um, picture on the left is showing you very short chains, but these chains become more stable the longer they are. They, they fold more stably because they have a better hydrophobic core. And the stability is uh, persistence, and that persistence is what leads you to increasing fitness. Increasing fitness in this case means ability to be to handle unruly environments. How long can I be stable in a complicated environment? And you get something like a that's a cartoony version of a fitness landscape that shows you that this does pump itself up. As long as I have uh, sequences being synthesized in a persistent way, then this mechanism of folding and catalysis will kick in and it will make longer and longer sequences that fold better, that catalyze better, and so on. And the oh, last slide, I think it's the last slide. So the argument I've made here is that um, to find the origin of life, our view is that you have to first look for the origin of evolution as a process. You have to look for where does the dynamic adaptation mechanism come from? Where could that have come from? And then we worry about what are the molecules? Maybe it's RNA, maybe other proteins come next, maybe lipids, maybe you form cells and so forth. But that you first have to get something that is autocatalytic, that does sampling over sequences, and that has a fitness function to it. So this, you're look, we're looking for disorder to order processes in molecules. We're looking for sequence to function processes, and that has to be in polymers. Um, so disorder to order, meaning lots of roots like a funnel would have, correlations where local advantages add up, uh, in this case in protein stability. Fitness is just persistence until you get to things that start looking more like cells. And, uh, and then possibly at the very last bullet point is possibly this HP Foldemer mechanism um, might have been the start. And then the last slide is um, just thanks to you. Picture on the left is uh, just a little, what are the odds of that kind of calculation? And these are the folks that did all the work. <clears throat> and thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much, Ken. That was a beautiful talk. Uh, lots of interesting ideas and concepts. Um, there are a couple questions. So if you do have further questions, go ahead, type them into the chat or the question and answer dialog box. One question is, could you expand on the point you made about biology as a process that adapts to the fluctuations of the environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the issue that we have, so if I took... <clears throat> there's no environment for biology today that is rock solid. Uh, you, can, you can see some very interesting things in real biology. If you take a system that lives in an environment that has virtually no fluctuations, always provides food, always provides it in the same way, always provides it at the same time of day, always gives you all the other ingredients you need. When you find cases like that, they're pretty rare, but when you find cases like that, it turns out you find cells that are very, very non-adaptive. They have gotten rid of all the rest of the machinery they need to do very much Darwinian evolution because they don't need it. This is how they live. But 
most biology has a, a much bigger problem than that. So E. coli has evolved to be able to not only eat glucose, but eat, eat other very, uh, various forms of sugars, for example. We, on the other hand, we humans can go to a grocery store and there's 40,000 different types of food we can eat in any combination you want at any time of the day. And we have evolved over time to be able to handle any input of food and any resource fluctuation. And so it's a lot of this is really ultimately about having a, an environment that's unruly, but being able to survive in it. And what, what's learnable, and so when, when you run the mathematics on changing environments, um, you've es essentially always what you see is, if I change the environment too much, I just kill everything. So life wouldn't survive. If I change the environment only a small amount in ways that the system has some degrees of freedom that it can handle that, and it has enough time to handle it, it has a time some time constants that allow it to handle that, then it can survive a boom and bust period. So what we we do in a lot of our calculations are these boom bust cycles. So a boom, I've got food for a while, everybody's happy, all my all my populations are happy. Then I do a bust, everybody's shut down, no food for a period of time. That completely will change your populations. So some uh, of the cells are okay with it. They can survive over the bust period. And then when the new boom comes, uh, a lot of other types of cells have all been killed off. And now what's left over is whoever was able to survive through the valley of the of the doom. So that's that's what I mean. So in in essence, what is people think of as Darwinian evolution is um, organisms that match their environments. And yes, that's absolutely true. But there's one more thing they match. They learn the history of the environment too. They learn, they've learn. they learned through unruly environments. So we humans, for example, are here as a consequence of huge amounts of evolution over other species that have lived through all kinds of booms and busts. Where there's no dinosaurs anymore. Most species that ever lived on Earth are not around anymore. But our genomes have, have been basically the benefactors of all the boom and bust cycles that killed off everybody else. We, we can sort of handle what nobody else is able to handle. And there is a lot of evolution that is really all about the boom bust cycles and all about the unruliness of the environment and all about the ability to respond to environments and the environmental history that never gets studied. We can do this with this uh, with this DEM machine dynamics, however, and so we're spending a lot of time thinking about those issues. Okay, so the number of questions grows quite quickly here. So maybe we'll take a couple more and then we'll we will close it up. And if you want to hang around later afterwards, uh, you're welcome to do so. But let's let's take two more questions. Um, a related question about fitness. The question is, how do we define fitness mathematically? Would this not require advanced knowledge of later conditions? Fitness seems to be dependent on later conditions requiring maybe advanced time similar to what's often done in electrodynamics. Can retrocausality be used to <sighs> reconstruct DEM? Wow, very cool question. And it really hits a nail on the head. Yes, how do you define fitness mathematically? It isn't easy. And so for first of all, um, almost, well, let me, let me put it this way. You really can't define it as a property just of a single organism. It's really only a competitive, it's it's only a delta thing. It's a competitive thing. Did I survive in some way better? Did my population get better than your population when we went through a boom bust? And if the answer is yes, then that's fitness. Well, now what does that mean? How would I write that in advance into a mathematical form? So first of all, there's many, many ways you can write approximate fitnesses that are individual dependent and so forth. And so just growth rate. You know, can I make them? I can make models and and like E. coli cells and bacterial cells where I say something about, all right, what is fitness? It's just uh, how fast I duplicate. <clears throat> Fine, I can I can make a lot of very simple models. But the reality coming, the question that really hits the nail on the head about the reality is really complicated, because um, the reality is you don't know what you're going to have to survive, and you you don't know what it means to even be competitive. And the powerful thing about this Darwinian evolution machine thing is that it functions no matter what the environment does to you, 
maybe I'm changing the food source, or maybe I'm changing the temperature or the pH, or maybe I'm, I have a competitor, it's a predator prey situation. <clears throat> All kinds of different things that I couldn't possibly write in advance into a fitness function. All I know is if I put that into the model, I turn the crank, I ask who lived at the end of it? Well, that one was more fit. Um, so trying to nail down the answer to that question is a deep and interesting and and still very challenging research question. We're, we're trying to get a handle on it. It's it's not trivial. Uh, one one thing is it's a it can be sort of thought of as a uh, an, a present value of expected value kind of thing, meaning um, I have to figure out given what I have and what I know at the moment, what is what would be my uh, long-term future? I'm going to integrate over my progeny in the future, and I'm going to ask, how do my progeny do compared to anybody else? And this, I think, is coming a little bit towards a, the question that was asked here. Uh, I integrate over how many progeny am I ultimately going to have? Well, I can't know that um, until I know precisely how the environment is going to hammer me and uh, who I'm going to be competing with when it does hammer me. And then when I come out of all this, I can do in retrospect, in retrospect, I can say, oh, well, of course, you know, this is why I won. You know, it's like on the 11 o'clock news, why did the stock market go up? Well, I can tell you yesterday why I think it went up or down, but I can't tell you tomorrow, you know, same kind of thing. <laughs> Excellent. So in the interest of time, I think maybe we should 